what we're going to talk about right now, <clears throat> did everybody get a little bookmark with colors? If you didn't, let me know. We've got a whole bunch back there. <clears throat> this is to take home and to help remind you of the things that you can do for each other. Most of you are probably running on empty a lot of times. If you've just heard a diagnosis for your child, you just kind of feel like you've been hit by a Mack truck and you walk through a daze for a long time. And in the overwhelmed state, it is hard to make decisions and to think of things that we need to be doing and to encourage each other. And so <clears throat> we can do one of two things in our families and with others. We can encourage them. Okay? All right. Hello. Oh, good. A thousand more. Thank you. I'll just hold this. Okay? Thanks. We can encourage each other, and that gives somebody courage. Or you can discourage somebody with your words and actions, and it drains the courage from them. And when you're running on empty and you're so overwhelmed, you really don't have much courage left. And so we don't pick up on the cues from others in our family and from other people who are going through our lives. We're going to be talking about families briefly, but let me just say something about the, the medical professionals that you all meet also. They are humans first and professionals second. They have the same things that you deal with at home. <clears throat> if you talk to them individually, and I have at different times, and they have marital situations. They have health problems. They have teenagers. And they choose to work in a profession, either cardiology, oncology, wherever they are at the hospital, nurses. They choose to work with all of you all and with families who need so much from them. <clears throat> so first of all, think. You're humans first. Now we're going to talk about personalities. There are four main colors that I'm using. <clears throat> and these are kind of the four main personalities. One of these is a yellow. We're going to start with that one. This is the extreme extrovert. This is the person who just kind of brings light into your room. These People start out as babies this way. They babble, their eyes shine, they want to hug you. And so these people are talkers and touchers. They come over to you and they hug you and they touch you and they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. <laughs> and I understand that because I are one. Yes. We also lose things. We can't keep up with things. We lose our keys and we make little notes on little pieces of paper and instead of putting it back where it belongs in your huge notebook that you got with all of the papers that you have, we just go, I'm sure I'll remember that. And so we write it out on a piece of paper and we stick it somewhere on a table with another stack of paper and we cannot find them. And so we have no left brain, you know, no organizational skills whatsoever. And who have we usually married? A blue person who doesn't talk that much, who is very organized, who doesn't know why we talk so much or why we have lost another set of keys. And we cannot balance the budget. We make guesstimates when we're trying to balance anything. They are so good at details. But how do these two people react to each other, especially if you're going through a huge crisis, like having a child with a chronic or criti critical illness? We look at the other person and think, why don't they react like I do? And so we have to come to appreciate what we're like, but what somebody else is like too. The things that drain a yellow person 
is to be by themselves. They need people fixes. They want to talk to somebody. They want to be with other people. And the things that drain a blue person is having to be with other people and talk to them. And it just drains them completely. And it's so hard to get into that other mindset of what that's like. My husband and I are just wonderful examples of this. We can go anywhere and we will come out of a meeting or something. He is in cancer research. He's been doing this for 43 years. And so he's, he is just about a total left-brained person. And we go somewhere and we'll come out and I'll say, did you meet so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And he said, I know. You have made 50 new best friends since we've been here. And he has met one person. Blues will lay down their life for that one good friend. They cannot understand why yellows consider anybody who smiles at us at the Walmart line can be a potential friend. These little ones start out bubbly. And this continues all your life. I was at a nursing home about two years ago. <laughs> and I had taken my third grade Sunday school class and they had made um, Thanksgiving cards for these people. And so we went room to room and they handed them out. And this one lady, she was 85 and she was sitting on her bed and she was smiling. And as we went in, she said, oh, thank you so much. And she was loving on the kids. And in passing, she said, I've had such a wonderful life. And I said, well, I am so glad. And she said, this was out of the clear blue. I was born with a heart defect. And I said, you were? And I said, I'm just working on a book for that. And she said, I said, was it, it must have been very difficult. I mean, this was 85 years ago. And she said, no, not really. She said, I had the most wonderful siblings in the world. She said, we lived in a two-story house with a very steep staircase and so whenever they would come down stairs to go outside to play, I couldn't play. But they would get me under my arms and bring me down the staircase, take me outside. And when they were playing, I would sit on the grass in the front yard watching them. So I was sort of a part of things. And when I got tired, they would take me under my arms and carry me up the steep staircase and take me to my bed so I could rest and read. She said they never wanted me to feel different and left out, and I never did. And she said I grew up, still had my heart defect, but it got better enough that I got married and I even had children. And she said, and today I still feel like I have a blessed life. This was a woman who was as yellow as she could be. The lady in the next bed to her was sitting there and she said, she is so happy all the time. All she thinks of are positive things and everybody who walks into our room, she just embraces. That is a yellow. There are two other colors, the red and the green. The red is a very determined child who grows into a very determined adult. They have high energy and they, even with a heart defect, they know that they want to be in charge. And when they're too, good luck. <laughs> you have to set boundaries for them because they will take over anything. My favorite red story is when I was <clears throat> Uh, substituting in a kindergarten class years ago and I walked in <clears throat> and so I'm trying to meet all the children before the class starts and so I'm getting down on their level and looking them in the eye and talking to them and finding out what their name is and introducing who I am <clears throat> and so pretty soon this little guy comes over to me and he pulls out his hand and he shakes my hand and he said I want you to know my name is Eric. I will help you with anything you need today. I can tell you about everyone in the class. 
And I said, well, Eric, thank you very much. And so I go on, and so I go to the next child, and I'm down, and I'm talking to this little girl eye to eye, and I feel this tap on my shoulder. And I look around, and there's Eric. And he whispers into my ear, that's Sarah. She will have a very hard time today because the real teacher isn't here. And she'll probably cry a lot. Eric was absolutely right. She whimpered through the whole day. But he knew that. He told me about every child in class. And every time I got down, I felt this on my shoulder. And I'd look around, and there was Eric. He was telling me about every child and what I needed to do as the teacher. After that morning was over, that was back in the olden days when we had half time, half day kindergartens, he started to leave and I went over to him and I took his hand and I said, Eric, thank you for your help today. And he pulled himself up to his little five year old height and he said, you're welcome. And he got on the bus to go home. And I know when Eric got home, he went into his house and his mama probably said, well, how was your day today? And he probably said, Mama, Ms. Hall wasn't there. We had the substitute, and she did not know anything with what she was doing, but I helped her. <laughs> that little Eric now today is about 37, and I'm sure he's in charge of something somewhere, and is probably doing a very good job. So we appreciate Reds. We have to give them boundaries, especially when they're little, because they'll take over your whole family. And they need those boundaries. And especially with a heart child. They think they can do anything and they're invincible. You don't want to keep them in a bubble, like has been said, but they need to have boundaries. <clears throat> they are usually married to the opposite green. Greens go with the flow. <clears throat> they have no highs. They have no lows. They're just steady. They're very low energy. And so this is really hard if you have a heart child because they need to be doing some things. They much prefer to sit on the sofa and to watch TV and to take a nap. Greens love naps. And who are they married to usually? A red, who cannot imagine why somebody needs a nap or needs to slow down. But they need that. They also get lost in the shuffle, people. I remember when I used to substitute and in school I'd come home and I could name every yellow in the classroom because they had talked the whole time. I could name every red because they tried to take over my job. And I could name every blue because they were very, very despondent. And I would love on them all day long. And there would be about three or four kids and I kept thinking, I can't think of the names. Who were those kids? They were the greens because they don't demand your attention. They're just there and they just go with the flow. There was a lady I met on the airplane and I will tie this up now. And we were, we got on the plane in Oklahoma City, that's where I'm from, where our kids live. And <clears throat> she was sitting over here and she was reading a book. Well, my first thing on a plane is I'm going to meet a new best friend and we're going to kill two or three hours talking. And so I turned to her and I said, um, are you going to Maryland? And she said, yes. And she said something about her family in Oklahoma. And I said, oh, I said, um, are you married and have children? And she said, yes. She did not crack a smile. She had this, you know, composure. And she said, I said, how many children do you have? And she said, seven. And I said, wow. <laughs> I said, we just have four. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna have two or three hours. We're gonna swap stories. We're gonna laugh together. We're gonna cry together. And it's gonna kill the three hour flight. And I said, my. I said, you must have a really interesting household. And she looked at me and she said, no. And she said, well, two of them are twins. It's like it negated she had seven children. And I said, 
oh my goodness. And so I'm, I'm getting ready. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And she goes back to her book, and I thought, this is a green mama who has looked forward to being away from the chaos in her family. And I'm sure if I ask her husband the same question, he'd say, John, yeah, it's not exactly calm here. And I thought, I can give her a present. I am going to give her silence. And I am not going to talk to this woman. She doesn't realize I'm doing this, but I am. Because that's what she needs, that's what she wants, and that fills her emotional tanks. Blues and greens need to be by themselves to fill back up. I'm sorry, they come to something like this or anything else and they are drained before it's over. Yellows have come in and thinking, I am going to meet all these new best friends. Reds have come in and thinking, I could have organized this better. No matter how it goes, because no matter what they get to, they feel like they can do it better than it was done. They can take over any committee, and they don't have to know anything about it. But they know how to organize and tell you what to do and follow through on it. We all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. And when you're going through this major thing in your life with your journey, you have probably put a lot of these other things on the back burner. They need to be addressed. You need to give the other people in your life these little gifts. What do you need from me today? What can I do for you? In the back of my book, I have what I call the Uniquely Made Personality Study, Y-O Uniquely Made. And it's just kind of the same thing we've been talking about, but it kind of gives some helpful hints. And things with your children, there's another chapter on siblings, they react differently. And these dear young adults who were sitting up here, oh, they were wonderful. They give you a whole new perspective. But the main thing is to stay in tune with the people in your life. Do not start pulling apart. That is so easy to happen. And you pull further and further and further. Pull it back together again. Spend that time. Talk about it. Even if it's somebody that feels uncomfortable with talking, still say, I really appreciate you. I really do. And we need to be appreciated. We need to be loved and have our emotional tanks filled. Okay, thank you. It's 4 o'clock. <laughs>